And welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. It's not the Monday edition or the Wednesday or the midweek edition. This is the Friday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And I'm Gavin Ashenden. And it's Friday, the 4th of October, which is the Feast of St. Francis. Okay, welcome to the program, YouTubers. We love having you here. We love that you took time to sit down and click the play button. But you have responsibilities, and I know a lot of you, I, I'm going to skip over the first three minutes because Kevin just asked too much of us. No, I don't. Just click the like button. Just subscribe, comment. The comments are alive. You guys are just continuing the show in the comments. We appreciate it. If you've not subscribed, it's time to subscribe. We've not hit the 5,000 level yet. I'm looking forward to that day. Maybe we'll give a free car to somebody on the 5,000. No, we don't have any cars. Matchbox car. I'm sending out matchbox cars to the 5,000th subscriber to the program. Lots of news to cover. I think we're all recovered from the wineskins. I've recovered. George had a good week. You, you got the, you're not in collar. Kind of uh, just an angle on scripted day here. Day off from work. Working from the kitchen, uh, dining room table at home today. Uh -huh. And Gavin, I, people aren't going to believe this because you're not pixelated, but you are actually in France this week. Yes, it's even rain, raining, so I really should be pixelated. But amazingly, the, uh, uh, the the French internet infrastructure is holding up in the face of the local tempests. So um, no one's as grateful as I am. Okay. Or, or myself, the guy who goes crazy every time you kind of pixelate. Um, we got lots of news out there. We'll start with some international news. Kenya had their House of Bishops uh, meeting and voted to support women bishops. And I know in GAFCON, this is the big topic. And I thought we could uh, discuss this, starting with you, George, because a lot of people don't understand the East African revival was done by the Church uh, Mission Society. And therefore, there's a lot of women in leadership, and they have a different understanding of women in church leadership, George. Yes, I, I, I we, 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 well, let's begin by saying, uh, there are Anglicanisms that differ around the world. Yes. On Wednesday and Thursday of last week, the every two-year meeting of the Uga a Kenyan Synod gathered at All Saints Cathedral, Nairobi, and they've begun a process of revising the constitution and canons on the formation of dioceses and the elections of bishops. And they passed a number of resolutions which now will go to the diocese uh, for comment and change, and then come back in two years' time for further action. In revising the Episcopal elections, uh, they've been plagued by a number of lawsuits after contested elections, so they now say no election may be held until three months after the last man goes, so as to prevent any, uh, any sense of influence of one man picking his successor. They want to increase the minimum age from 35 to 45 because they've not had good success with 30-year bishops. Mandatory retirement age is 65. And the Kenyan constitution has long stated the, uh, that uh, all priests in good standing over a certain age may stand for election. Women have been priests in Kenya for going on 25 years. But they wanted to make this crystal clear, and so they're going to add an additional clause any priest in good standing, 45 years or over, changing the age, male or female. So clarifying those words. So this is not a change, but just the Kenyan church is making it crystal clear where they stand on this point. Women have stood for election in the past in Kenya, and the experience of the Kenyan church is that women... Uh, People who sort of throw up, oh, well, in the United States and in England, look what happened. When you had women, everything fell apart at that point. When, the Ken when that's brought to the Kenyans, they say, we've had women and everything has been fantastic. Some of the best clergy, some of the most successful clergy, some of the greatest evangelists and preachers. So, from an ex so the experience argument doesn't cut it with the Kenyans. And what you touched on, Kevin, was that the East African revival, which touched Congo, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, parts of Tanzania, in the 1930s, basically set the church on fire, created many, many new believers, and was primarily sociologically female-led. Female 
the main leaders were men, of course, but the people who actually did the work of conversions in the villages, in the, in the, in the cities, were women evangelists. So Kenya is going to have a woman bishop sooner rather than later, and this will test the Gafcon Fellowship, I believe. And well, because does not the Jerusalem uh, Declaration say we're just not going to go that far? You might remember I, that correctly. We're no, gonna... I, I don't believe the Jerusalem Declaration says that. Okay. I, I will have to be fact-checked by our viewers on we, this. Yeah, point. we'll have to fact-check it. I've not finished my coffee yet, so that's that's up to debate. And but what, what happened to, in... Two years ago, South Sudan mm -hmm. uh, elected a woman as an assistant bishop of one of the more difficult areas. Uh, and the GAFCON primates meeting gathered, and they had already pledged not to do this as a moratorium because Nigeria, alone among the GAFCON provinces, does not ordain women to the ministry, and they wanted everybody to be in the same spot. So they said, let's not do it. Well, the Sudanese didn't go to that meeting and they didn't get the word, or if they got the word, they didn't uh, take it and inwardly read and inwardly digest it. But after that meeting, the new primate of South Sudan, Justin Badi Arani, Ara Amani, said, yes, we'll have no more women bishops. We'll honor the moratorium. But see, the word is moratorium, which is an agreement not to act rather than agreement as to the merits of the underlying argument. Hmm. Now, Gavin, in the big world of Anglicanism, there's division amongst uh, women in clerical roles, uh, women's orders, we'll call it. Um, and some people are uncomfortable with this, probably yourself included. Yes, I don't disagree, of course, with anything that George has said, except that he did mix up ministry and orders uh, as he described Kenyan uh, delight in the blessing that women ministers uh, have been. We described evangelists, uh, 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 their work in evangelism and pastoral care. And of course, the notion that people who want to retain Anglicanism's uh, rootedness with the Western Catholicos tradition, uh, uh, for us, women's ministry is, is a delight. It's, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. What we're what we're discussing is whether or not ministry and orders are the same thing, and mm. we think they're not. The only reason we think they're not is because the Anglican Church was born out of the Western Church for one and a half thousand years. Anglicanism retained its orders, and now it was free to not retain them. The Presbyterians didn't retain them. The Pentecostals didn't. The Methodists didn't. We're we're free not to have them, but if we have them, how do we define them? Either we make it up as we go along, which is one possible way or we keep what the church has understood. And the problem that people like me have is that when Jesus promised he'd leave the church into all truth and the apostles chose their successes and the apostolic inheritance became more and more clearly defined in things that really mattered, like creeds and order, after one and a half thousand years or, or 2,000 years, so they'd say, okay, we'll make it up by ourselves now. You know, that's a different kind of church. And so that's the problem. The problem is, what, does that, what is Anglicanism? Up until now, it's sought to be the best of all worlds. It's sought to, to maintain the rootedness in Christian tried history and experience and be open to the Holy Spirit for renewal. But, but renewal is not conceptual renewal. It's not new ideas about what the church is. So my difficulty is that, that here is Gafcon uh, saying that we will confront the spirit of the age, which makes up new ideas and plants them into Christianity. And here, one of the most powerful ones, which is which is feminism, uh, is is reconfiguring what the church has always understood to be its 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 it orders. Now, if Gafcon, liberal Anglicanism does that, and in that in that sense, liberal Anglicanism to many of us is not Anglicanism; it's a kind of secular Protestantism. But if, if GAFCON does that too, then, then what is Anglicanism? Where, where is it to go if you get your theology from the Bible and the apostles and the way it's worked out and been tested in church history and retained at the Reformation uh, by Cranmer and by Hooker above all? Where do you go? And the answer is, if Kenya proves to be the new model, there's only one place to go, and that's Rome. And many of us would say, well, 
We don't, we'd rather not be forced out to Rome in the name of feminism. Can the Kenyans not have women evangelists, women healers, women intercessors, women leaders, uh, women prophets? Can they not have all those things without also turning the definition of priest and bishop into something that it never has been? Now, George and you have a different understanding of the roles of clergy. Um, or the, or the strictest <laughs> definition of, of the roles of cler clergy. And I, I want to hear from George, you know, your kind of definition as a minister slash priest. Well, I don't think we have definite, def I don't think we have different definitions because I think I would agree with the definitions that Gavin has placed, but I think it works out into how practically it works out. I don't, I don't really view my self as a priest. I view myself as a minister. And that comes out of my training, my heritage, my experience, my background. I have uh, three female assistants, three female deacons. Um, they, we have successful women priests in the Diocese of Central Florida who do a wonderful job. Uh, we don't have a woman bishop and probably won't. Now, these are, if you will, practical and pragmatic arguments, and my I'm, on a, I'm at a different pay grade than Gavin. Gavin's charged to defend the faith and to teach the faith. I'm not a bishop, I'm a priest. And I uh, see my function differently and I'm not really that exercised on the issue of women's orders. I appreciate what Gavin says and I hear the arguments of a priest being an icon of Christ at the altar and all this and that. And, but it, it sort of passes over my head really because I really don't, it's not part of my lived experience of daily life and ministry. And it's okay, for it to, and that, that's okay until the George and I can live in the same church very happily mm. with a huge amount of mutual affection and respect until culture forces us to decide between these two narratives. And that's mm. the problem where we are now. George and I would like it to go on exactly as we are, mutual flourishing. I hugely respect George's understanding of ministry. Indeed, I incorporate it myself. It's just I add an extra layer, which I get from the first one and a half thousand years of the church, which I think is valuable. But the problem here is that what is Anglicanism? Anglicanism appears to have an understanding of baptism. Uh, it, it appears to have multi-understandings of baptism multi-understandings of the Eucharist, multi-understandings of the authority of Bible, multi-understandings now of priests and bishops. Where, where is there any glue that holds Anglicanism together ecclesiologically if it's not in what remains of, of uh, episcopacy, apostolic episcopacy? If you take that away, it looks like we're just a bunch of pragmatists living under a multi-ideological umbrella. If it will, it, let's sort of paint out the, what that uh, landscape looks like within Anglicanism. And well, let's focus on those who are not in favor of women priests, uh, women priests or women bishops and whatnot. Because there, there's some, I call them strange bedfellows in this argument. You have, if you will, uh, the Diocese of Sydney being the exemplar of the complementarian mindset, which the Roman Catholic or Anglo-Catholic traditionalist mindset would say, this is nonsense. No, 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 the Catholic Church has specifically rejected complementarianism but it, it, well, because they come at it from a complete, they come at it from a completely different approach. They George, both wind up at the same spot. <laughs> Give me a moment. Just what, <laughs> what the Catholic Church would say to the Sydney people is, congratulations on taking St. Paul's understanding of metaphysics and sexuality and the Trinity seriously, because that's what they're doing. Now, they work it out in a Protestant fashion that leads to categories I don't endorse, but I love the roots of it. The roots are, let's give this thing epistemological integrity. It's the Bible. And, and they have an un they've grasped that St. Paul is teaching a form of inverted hierarchy in which sex really matters as part of the narrative of Revelation. Now, they work that out in a Protestant way, and I think the way they work it out is mistaken. But the roots of their understanding are very good. But here, here's the, I, well, I, I don't disagree with you, Gavin, and I think you're being kind, but at the same point, this mindset is a, uh, this began in the late 1940s it, of the complementarian mindset. This is not part of the first one and a half, one and a half millennia of the, end, of the uh, Christian ethos. This is no, a relatively new phenomenon. You wouldn't uh, expect 
Protestant movement not to do that. <laughs> um, but, so, I mean, I, I understand, but, but I mean, you can be right for the wrong reasons. But, but the, the, the point that I'm going is that the argument that a complementarian would put forward as to reason why not to have women priests or women clergy, uh, except, for its, except for its ends, would not be the reason put forward by a traditionalist. Yeah, we're agreed because, on that. Yep. Because they, and they come at it from a completely different place. Uh, they come to the same conclusion, but that same conclusion, uh, once you start pressing it a little further, if you take the Sydney position a little bit further, they are quite keen on lay celebration of the Eucharist. And that's all part of the complementarian uh, theological uh, pro project, if you well, will. I'm not saying they're tied yeah. intimately, but the We're same things up. that... You know, pretty soon, Gavin's just going to get chest pain, you know. <laughs> no, no, but what, um, what I'm trying to say is that we, we need to basically paint a picture of a landscape here that there is not unanimity as to everybody who agrees as to the conclusion comes with the same place. That's Anglicanism. And, and George, with respect, George, I think you're setting up a straw man. I'm not saying that that's what Anglicanism should be. I'm saying there needs to be enough handholds for us to be glued together, not none. And we're getting to the point now where there are so few. What, what is Anglicanism, apart from a kind of pick-and-mix post-Reformation spirituality that borrows all, it borrows everything from the universal church and then makes it a pantomime thing by turning something else. It borrows the Eucharist, but it means something else. It borrows baptism, but it means something else. Borrows bishops and priests, but it means something else. And, you know, there comes, it has to have some kind of sound. Of, that's, in the end, that's why Newman jumped <laughs> because every time he pressed to see how far the church's roots went, they didn't go down far enough. Well, part of the, I, I agree with you, uh, with all of your criticisms, but I basically come, my argument is it's a fool's errand to find those hands hold, hand holds. Um, well, well, with respect to George, when... <laughs> well, <laughs> let, 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 let me, I'll, I'll, let me explain why I say that. Let me explain why I say that. Uh, I happen to have a, Particular, I have a, happen to have a particular knowledge of uh, Anglican church history, and one of the one of my earliest uh, works and projects was how Anglicans got around endorsing contraception. And the reason, and it all started with the First World War, when in the Church of England, uh, the bishops were asked by the British military to give their tacit approval for the distribution of condoms as a prophylactic against venereal diseases, and the Church of England signed off as did the American Expeditionary Force. The Bishop of Western New York was the chief chaplain and he was asked by General Pershing, is it moral good to give the troops condoms so they don't bring home the French disease when they come home? And the church said yes. And at the 1920 Lambeth Conference, they talked about this and the bishops as a body said no. 1930, they talked about it again. And what this time they did is they changed the committee head. The man they had who spearheaded no Bishop Winnington Ingram of London, who was a celibate uh, priest of a Catholic traditional mindset, he was put in charge of youth ministry. And they had uh, William Temple and company take uh, human sexuality. And they said, yes, contraception is a moral good for all these pragmatic reasons. Well, the Catholic Church responded with uh, the encyclical Costi Canubi, attacking Anglicanisms for making it up on the fly. But what happened in Humanae Vitae? What Pope Paul VI turned down was the Anglican version of human sexuality, which Francis is doing his very best to impose on the Catholic world. Mm. So this, this idea that Catholicism is an unchanging rock. Anglicanism is merely the canary in the coal mine that Catholicism tests out some of the latest and craziest stupidities. But that's, that's with the Amazon coming up, you're going line. to have <laughs> you're going to have married priests. You're going to have women deacons. You're going to have birth control in Germany. You're going to have the blessing of homosexual unions. And this is the Roman Catholic Church I'm talking about, not the Episcopal Church. George, so to, to try to find a handhold in some unchanging thing, I really think you need to go to Orthodoxy because you're not going to get it in Catholicism. Okay, so 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 here's a brief reply. <laughs> <laughs> that was very well done, by the way. I really like that. Was that was good. That was good. <laughs> um, so, so first of all, in, instead of going to, to birth control and, and secularism and Anglicanism as a kind of, of canary for progressive culture, which I don't believe in, uh, my views are formed by the Holy Spirit, uh, by the Bible, by church history. So the Holy Spirit said to me, Gavin, be an Anglican when I was converted in an in a evangelical rally as a law student. So I became an Anglican. I asked him, I said, Lord, I'd like to be a Pentecostal or Catholic. And he said, be an Anglican. So I said, fine, fine. 
So then I, I, I become an Anglican and I start learning what Anglicanism is, and I'm really quite impressed. I, I, I love its love of the Bible. And then I slowly begin to read about church history and I go, this is really wonderful. I, I'm part of a church whose umbilical cord is rooted right through, without interruption, through the saints and in, into the apostolic era, into the Bible. This is very exciting and lovely. And then in my lifetime, for, for political and progressive reasons, Anglicanism gets changed under my feet. Now, I can either, what I'm doing is I'm staying, I'm hanging on as long as I can. I, I, I don't, I agree with you that Roman Catholicism, like any church, uh, we, you know, we could, we could do the Dawkins thing and give ourselves a list of 150 evil things the Roman Catholics have, have done. But, but I think that misses the point. To, to, to my mind, uh, the point is that there is a struggle in our generation between progressive culture and liberalism and Orthodox Christianity. It's affecting the Roman Catholic Church. Of course it is. Uh, I have a confidence that the Roman Catholic Church will, with the weight of its experience, see it off in a way that Anglicanism seems unable to do. Uh, if I'm wrong, then Jesus may be right and he may come down and say, is, is there any faith left on earth? But meanwhile, right. I, I'm, I'm, I, I need... I will have to go to where the faith is best kept, best best kept in number and depth. And at the moment, Anglicanism is making it very difficult for me to do that here. But if I may interject a personal note of history, uh, when I was uh, training and studying to be a priest, I had two Roman Catholic uh, instructors, theologians, both uh, one of whom worked very hard on trying to get me to become a Roman Catholic. Uh, my Systematic theology professor was a man named Avery Dulles. He later became a cardinal. He was a very famous Jesuit. Uh, he would come up from Fordham University to Yale, and he would have lunch on Thursdays with a small group of students before his classes, and his job was to do what was done to him. When he was at Harvard, he went up as a Presbyterian. He came out as a Catholic because of the influence of priests who would do it. So Avery Dulles is doing his best to sort of bring this group of people over to Catholicism, while uh, Father Berrigan was my Old Testament teacher. And this is uh, the brother of the famous uh, uh, anti-war protester, uh, both Jesuits, but as far apart on the theological spectrum as could possibly be. And the Catholicism I saw was the in the in, at Yale University, at Villanova University, where I studied as well, was the Catholicism of Berrigan, of sort of the liberal Catholicism. So the the Catholicism that you speak of, that you can point to, if, if you will, the Benedict Catholicism, is very far and few and in between. It's certainly non-existent in this part of the country, and Enjoy. it may be it may be strong in places like Poland and maybe individual parishes or groups like the Society Saint. SS Society Saint SSPX. What is that, Gavin? I'm sorry. Society of St. Pius X. Uh, Gavin, I, I, but it is not the reality of Catholicism on the ground. Your average Catholic priest in the United States is just, this is a terrible thing to say, is just as kooky and crappy as the average Episcopal priest. So I where I am, George, the Catholics are saying, Gavin, we're having a huge struggle with Vatican II and the progressives. Come and join us where the fight can be won. You've lost it in Anglicanism. You're wasting your time. That that begins to sound like a vacation. It does, but I don't think it can be won in Rome either. But I, I do want to finish up in this conversation. We're 24 minutes in and we've hit one topic. A great topic. Now, people who watch this, if you have an opinion, go to the comments section. You're, you're looking at us on YouTube right down there. I want to hear your opinion on this topic uh, that has been so fully discussed here. On Anglican script, I want to get a couple more stories in. Um, Kevin, can I just say one more thing? You can just, finish up just, quick, yes. But just, just about vocation. The thing is, I'm doing what the Lord has called me to do. Uh, that, that's that's why I accepted Episcopal orders, and that's why I'm an Anglican. Uh, he hasn't changed his instructions to say to me, "You are an Anglican, and I'm asking you to defend the faith." So, so in terms of vocation. I'm doing it. I would just like it. <laughs> and, and there are quite a number of people who are coming to me saying, thank you for speaking for us and articulating for us too. So that's, a, that's my vocation. That's what I'm doing. Uh, I, only if the Lord changes it can I become a Roman Catholic. 
not 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 because it's difficult or or unpleasant. And at the moment, there are enough Anglicans saying, please continue to speak out and represent this theological point of view on our behalf so we can stay Anglicans. The difficulty with the Kenyan vote is it just makes it so much more difficult. I and here's my opinion. I don't think it can be switched or won in Rome either. I think uh, um, because of Francis, there's going to be enough uh, uh, blocks put into pit place that any changes Francis makes are going to be very hard to undo or impossible. Moving on to the next story, I thought we would do an English story. Um, <laughs> Just for the fun of it. <laughs> uh, Lord Singh has resigned from the BBC Radio 4. Uh, he gives the Thought of the Day radio program occasionally, and he has complained that his executives and management have always said, you're being too anti-Islamic. We do not want to offend them. They kill people. I don't think they said that. But... Every time I hear this type of story, I'm like, is this like an overreaction to Sam and Rushdie? What is going on? Why are we not afraid to offend Hindu? We're not afraid to offend Sheikhs. We're not afraid to offend Christians. We're not afraid to offend anybody except for the Muslims. Gavin, you're going to write, have an article published, hopefully top left. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us what you think. And tell us a little bit about who Lord Singh is for the, the audience. <laughs> icons in England. Uh, the BBC has a morning radio show on something called Radio 4, which used to be the old home service uh, during the war. Uh, and it's pro it, it is the most prestigious broadcasting platform in the country. So between 6 and 9 a.m., this is where all politics happen. Prime ministers, government ministers, the, the leaders of, of multinationals, they all appear on this company and they're very, the, the, this program they're very glad to. For historic reasons, there's been a three-minute slot of spirituality, which was dominated by Anglicans for a long time, and has become multicultural and multi-faith multi in the last 50, 20 years. Uh, but, but if you get on there, it, the whole nation hears you. I mean, the cabinet hears you, the government hears you, everybody hears you. They may not think particularly much of you, but you have the opportunity. It's a, it's a great platform. Uh, it, it, for 35 years, the leader of the Sikh community in England, a guy called Lord Singh of Wimbledon, Wimbledon is where I grew up, which is which is makes it all more uh, affectionate for me, uh, has been speaking on behalf of the Sikhs, and he does a very good job. He says, Guru this and Guru that, says the other, and, and this is why Sikhism is nice. And, and here's a thought for your day. Um, now, suddenly, and, and with enormous impact, He's resigned and said after 35 years he will no longer do this. So this has really hit the papers in a big way in the last 24 hours. Uh, and, and perhaps next to the BBC's Radio 4, The Times is also one of our major organs for public discussion. So this morning, uh, and, and to get a letter in The Times or occasionally... I've managed to, to, to write, I've been asked to write an op-ed article on Islam. It, it's, a, it's a huge thing because you have a, 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 a prestigious is not the right word, but you, you have a, um, a, a serious platform making discussions. Um, it's quite hard to get letters in the Times. Um, I haven't had one published for two years because I write on gay issues and the managing director of the Times is a practicing gay, so that's not going to happen. But, but today I woke up to discover a letter from the letters editor, who's a terribly important man, saying, Gavin, here, the Lord Singh thing, give me 200 words by lunchtime. Um, well, this is nice. <laughs> so I've written 200 words and sent it to him, and hopefully it'll be published tomorrow. And effectively, I accuse the BBC, having been given this opportunity, uh, of, of instead of telling the truth about things, of preferencing identity politics and Islam, and because Lord Singh says so, censoring everybody else. So I've been censored by identity politics, Lord Singh's been censored by Islam, uh, and I'm pleased to make common cause. And I hope very much if they take my letter and publish it tomorrow, then on the back of Lord Singh, who's much more eminent and famous than me, uh, this will launch a public debate and have the BBC held more accountable for its extraordinary lurch into leftist propaganda that it's pursued in the last 10 years. So um, I was glad to be asked. I've done my best. We'll see what happens. George? We have NPR, National Public Radio. Um, it's government-supported. It's very liberal. Um, they don't... They 
we're not liberal. What are you talking about? We're mainstream. We give you all the news. In England, they have the BBC, which is also government-funded, run, and it's our NPR, uh, so to speak. What's wrong with having the government tell us what to think about the news and what the news is? He's a libertarian. This would be fun. Everything is wrong with it. Uh, I really can't get... I On the issue that Gavin has raised, I think it's terrible, that if the mandate of the BBC is to offer... Uh, a fair, impartial, balanced voice, they're not doing so. And they have done so by abandoning that mandate in order to temporize those people by whom they feel threatened. This is condescending to Muslims because they're basically saying Muslims are animals who don't have a mind of their own. They're a pack that uh, can get whipped up so, uh, so eagerly. And uh, therefore, we have to do everything we can to keep these poor little people uh, shut up in their council houses, quiet and away from our neighborhoods. So therefore, we're not going to do anything to upset them. It's appeasement. Well, you know, that's what they want to do. It's fine. I don't pay the BBC license fee. But no, the no, idea no. but the idea that the, B, the BBC is a total... It, 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 first off, it's not com comparable. NPR has no real standing, no real heft. Except in college towns in Washington, D.C., NPR is... Not a not a factor, not a player in its news in news reporting. It and to have the government subsidize something like that. If you want, if you want to hear what they're saying, you have your commercial op options of NB MSNBC, the three networks, uh, uh, so on and so forth. The BBC should be like C-SPAN, which has in the United States been faithful to its model of being non-biased, but it isn't. So the whole notion that the government has to be involved in having a, an official ministry of propaganda is abhorrent to my way of thinking. It's what? abhorrent. And the problem is they do such a bad job. Um, one of the, I used to write for a, lit, uh, for a, a journal that did a criticism of religious reporting. And there are exceptions, of course. Uh, Martin Bashir is an excellent reporter. Mm -hmm. But you get some of these uh, people who have no clue what they're writing about when they talk about religion. And they basically infuse their reporting with a sneer and a snide and a secular worldview about how quaint. It, it's what I call National Geographic reporting. Look at these quaint natives in their curious costumes. They're either fun to look at, but we can't take them seriously. And that's how the BBC covers religion. I myself think that the talk, you know, the those little talks are total waste of time. Whenever I've heard them, when I lived in England, they'd have these god awful women priests from London, Lucy something or other, who would say these just incredibly anodyne things. That if you want to go hear them in the United States, go chat up your Starbucks barista, and you get the same level of intellectual heft. But hey, you know it's your tax money, Gavin, not mine. Well, I don't, you I just don't, need to have a revolution. You really do. I don't watch the BBC television as I don't pay my license, and uh, that's, it. that's my way of protesting. But, um, but, but the real problem is that, that we we face an onslaught of a really serious kind because the the, the Gramsci threat for for Marxism 2.0, cultural Marxism, was we're going to march through the institutions. And the first institution they marched through and got hold of properly was the BBC. Uh, and it has been expressing very serious left and progressive cultural values for some time and, and pumping it out, as George says, exactly like propaganda. So, I mean, I'm glad I've been asked, you know, how nice the Times Letters editor decided that, that, that I, I might be able to write a repost. I hope it'll start something going. But the problem is it's, ti it's Titanic time. The uh, cultural ship and political ship is hole beneath the waterline. And again, rather like Anglicanism, uh, all, all many of us can do is try and put off the day when it sinks. So um, we're bailing hard because we haven't yet jumped ship. How much do you think a uh, terrorist attack like Charlie Hebdo has had an effect on the BBC and uh, other, especially the New York Times here in America, do you think they, they, they are fearing uh, Islam in a different way than... Uh, no, no, they're not fearing protecting. Islam at all. No, absolutely not. I mean, it's like, you know, last night, four French policemen were killed Stand. by a man with a knife. Hmm. 
uh, and and for 12 hours they said we we're not telling you his name and we've no idea what his motive was well if his name wasn't muhammad it'll be something like it and his motive was being converted to islam nobody else kills policemen with knives and 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 the the french refused to tell the truth about this even despite charlie hebdo and the english press to a to a to a to a transsexual but followed followed suit nobody has said anything about this fact they will never ever name islam for what it's done they're not afraid of islam they have been lulled into a kind of stockholm syndromesque relationship with it where they protect it and give it a special pass and it's it's i mean it, it is insane it is we we have lost our mind in the west and and it you know just telling the truth doesn't appear to to, to restore sanity in the culture we live in. Well, it's a postmodern worldview where there are no, there's not one truth. The, the message that the BBC is, and the French press, for instance, in this murder of the policeman of the Paris prefecture is that uh, what's right for us may not be right for them, and what's right for them isn't right for us. We just shouldn't be judgmental because these people are crazy loons and we just need to get on with our life. Well, George, it's, you can so, it's so condescending in you its worldview. George, you can understand it that, that, that whenever I find an epistemological vacuum of values, I get a bit edgy and I wonder if the system that has no epistemological authority can survive long. And the problem is that applies not only to our politics, but also to our ecclesiology. That's why I'm beginning to get a bit picky about wanting to have a scaffolding and a handhold where meanings mean what they were supposed to mean. So let's transition to a story just as crazy. The Bible is incompatible <laughs> with human dignity. Another English story that came out where a doctor who, uh, Dr. David, uh, he was a National Health Service employee, was fired from his post at the Department for Works and Pension in July because he would not use transgendered pronouns. I'll tell you my pronoun in a minute, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the craziness. I, I've discussed before in three or four different episodes that Christianity has lost the benefit of the doubt. You know, well, this is terrible. Here is a Christian doctor saying, uh, if you want to trust me as a doctor, you need to allow me to, to use the tools of my trade, which are biology. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, by the way, it, it's not incompatible to, to, to practice medicine, believe in biology, and be a Christian. So when he was sacked for his, from his government job uh, for, for saying that, that when somebody presents him in front of me, uh, I, I will look at their genitals and their chromosomes in order to establish what sex they are, uh, he was sacked. And so he appealed. Uh, and the panel stated, in its decision, refusing his appeal, the panel stated that Dr. Macarus' belief that the Bible teaches us that God made us humans, male or female, was... And here's the killer phrase, incompatible with human dignity. Now, Tom Holland, Tom Holland has just written a major book called Dominion saying that the whole notion of human dignity is predicated upon the Bible. And, and it is. It just, it just is. It's a magisterial book. And he, he proves what many of us have been saying philosophically, historically, and culturally for a long time. But the fact that we have a panel of judges in an employment tribunal saying, again, saying the opposite of what is true is, is really problematic. And, and here in terms of, you know, we talked about the long march to the institutions and the BBC falling first. So here's the judiciary. We have three low-level employment judges uh, not telling the truth because of their, their, their personally bias in a way that's not totally different from 11 high court, 11 Supreme Court judges not telling the truth because they're politically biased. Well, we come back again to an epistemological vacuum that is causing us trouble. We had a similar, not we had a similar type of case. Uh, a, a nurse at a Vermont hospital was fired by the hospital after she refused to participate in an abortion. She uh, was a uh, practicing Christian, and she knew, you know, everybody knew this, and yet she was scheduled to take part in a termination, and she declined, and because she declined, she was fired. Now, there are laws in the United States that protect you against that. But do hospital administrators in Vermont give a damn about the law? No. Now, in some respects, I think the tribunal was correct in its conclusion that the Bible is incompatible with human dignity. 
if we're assuming that the human dignity is the dignity of the fallen, broken, sinful world and creation, the Bible's the antidote uh, to sin. It's the, you know, the, the t truths and teachings there are what lead you out. See, I mean, part of the problem with the Episcopal Church is that it seeks to affirm you as you are and does no work to try to lead you into the path of repentance and righteousness and make and help you be the best that God created you to be rather than leaving you sunk in the sin and death and brokenness that you are in. Yeah, you're stuck looking at me. What happened? All right. I have, I gotta have it, itis. And so I got an email this morning from Wirecast, which is the program we use to record the show, that said, ooh, we have a new update, version 13, be sure to install. And without thinking about, ooh, maybe it's not a good version, maybe it has issues and hasn't been completely tested yet, I installed it. 45, 45, no, 41 minutes into this episode, it crashed without telling me. It was still on the screen, but it stopped recording. And basically, you only missed the last two minutes of George and Gavin talking about really important... Ah, it was probably the most important stuff you've ever heard, but you don't get to hear it. It could have been an own, its own testament in, in Scripture. But you missed it because of Wirecast. I'm mad at you, Wirecast. Uh, but to show that we do read all the comments, one of our viewers said, Kevin, I noticed on screen that you have the new iPhone 11. What do you think about it? I love the new iPhone 11 Max. I got it the first day because it has three cameras. And if you guys don't know anything about me, I love video and I like taking pictures. Um, that's why I love living on a beach. I like to take pictures. And so I like uh, being able to do telephoto, uh, regular pictures and ultra wide. I stand on the beach and I ooh and ah and I take ultra wide pictures uh, all the time. It's a lot of fun. If you have the extra few hundred dollars, be sure to buy it. If you're going to put this on a credit card, don't buy it. It's not worth putting on a credit card. Never use credit card. Mm -mm. You've been watching Anglican Unscripted episode 540. I'm Kevin Carlson. That over there in the middle used to be George. And on the far right of your screen was Gavin Ashton. They're just not in their heads right now. What did you do, Kevin? All right, I have to go uninstall 13 and put 12 back on. Sorry, guys.